Hello, everyone. Just gonna write this here. Sorry, guys, I'm just writing the title. Hello, did I get a request? Hey, Jackie is about to join us. Hey. Hi. Hi. How are you? Uh, we almost, um, yeah, it, it's already the third week of the month, <laughs> or the fourth week. <laughs> Listen, I feel it. I think for any mother bringing their kids back to school, we felt this, what is it? It, feel, it feels like the longest September. Oh my That's, yeah, it's just been really, yeah. for a lot of us, like for those that have their kids in school, I'm sure they're ecstatic. And for, for me personally, where my kids, we were traveling. So when we got back, we are quarantining our kids at home. Um, yeah, I don't, I probably will get interrupted. It's funny because I hope they don't hear this, but I told I told them I'm like I'm leaving the I'm leaving to the office. I'm not home. I'm <laughs> upstairs with the kids, so I'm like I'm not here. So technically, I'm not officially here. So I really hope they don't find the car in the driveway and think, "Wait, did she walk to work?" <laughs> <laughs> so someone will be like, "Yes, mom, what? She walked to work." Yeah, so I'm like I'm not even here because they know like the minute I'm here. But can't they hear? It defaults to me because I'm in the basement and they're in the they're upstairs. Oh, so oh let's okay. hope they don't. They'll probably not come. Jude has like an Instagram account. She's like, "What the, mom? What are you doing online? I'm joining your live." Um, guys, thank you for joining us for another Six of City. This is episode seven. I was like, "How are we episode seven? I'm just yeah. I it's funny because I'm like I didn't even realize we were we were. It's just, yeah, it's crazy. So today's topic is what does an inclusive global economy mean? And we have a very, 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 very special guest that is dear to my heart. And I'm so excited to have her on here because she is doing such incredible things. And if you're not already following Pink Gin, you need to be following Pink Gin um, for all the stuff that they're doing and their market that they have. Um, and I'll let her kind of take the lead with kind of talking about everything. Um, but I guess I'll leave it to you, Jackie, with some intro points. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I don't know if we're looping, um, are we looping, are we looping? Laura we're gonna, yeah, so Laura will join us in uh, about 20 minutes. Cool. Um, so, and by the way, my, my cat is like going nuts this morning. So if you hear her, um, you have a cat, I have kids. They're yeah. All Sometimes she sounds like a kid. Uh, so we have a lot of really exciting news uh, for everyone. First off, um, City has, well, I'm going to skip to our favorite, <laughs> our favorite thing segment, um, which hasn't really become a segment yet because we only did it once, but now it's the second one. Ta-da! Yes, yes, yes. So guys, this has been such a labor. I'm like totally just showing you my, I don't know if you can even see my screen. Um, so we just, if you have not seen the post, I don't know, go to the post. Um, we just launched our new, we elevated, rebranded website. Um, it has been months in the making. It's something we've been wanting to do for ages. We've been dying over our last website. And for all of you that do have um, e-commerce people that do have sites, you know how hard it is sometimes um, to navigate and, and to kind of get everything together. And so it's been quite a while to kind of bring things together from the, from the beginning journey of like our, our rebrand in, in a way. Mm -hmm. um, and then kind of aligning those messaging and the colors and the tones and the messaging all together 
um, to come to this. So if you have not already, please, please take a few seconds today, a minute, um, visit our same domain, citysoap.com. Yeah. And you will see our newly rebranded elevated website. Um, but just to kind of touch on like why fix a website when you already have one, um, to us, we really wanted to ensure that our mission and our values and our impact and our products um, were really at the forefront of everything that we do. So um, we wanted to make sure that our audience really understood you know, the holistic aspect of what we have to offer um, and really give ourselves the opportunity to tell our story in a different way. Um, in a, in a, in a, in a better way. And I think that was, that was one of the things that we always struggled with, with the website was, um, you know, just from a technological standpoint, we were really limited in what we could do and how we could, um, tell our story in a creative way and, and in, in a user friendly way too. Right. I think that was really important for us. Um, and so with this new website, there are a lot of things you can see that are different, but there are also a lot of things that you don't see that are different, that are on the back end of everything that for us as, as people who are running a business, it makes life so much easier and not, we're not being sponsored by Shopify here, but I mean, there are a lot of benefits to, you know, if you want to look at it from a, a really just tactical logistical standpoint. Um, there are a lot of benefits to improving the back end of your site as a an e commerce like provider. Um, so we had, I mean, I don't know. Give an example, Nora, of one of the things that was really like clunky about the other site that we had to improve. Oh, on. so I don't know if you guys remember, we launched when we launched our subscription box. We couldn't actually launch it on our existing box because a lot of things went wrong. We had a lot of bugs. Um, the checkout was really, really difficult, and we don't really t talk about this stuff openly. Um, to talk about how the day we launched, things were crashing and were not working. And what ended up happening, and I'll share a story, and I don't even know if my husband's going to end up seeing this, but the week that we launched our site, our checkout crashed. Um, nobody could make a proper purchase. And I remember distinctly um, one of our international advisory board members, Chelsea Brown, she was like, I can't check out. There's something wrong. And thank yeah. God she messaged me. Thank you, Chelsea. And she was like, something's going on with your checkout. And it turned out like there, everything was showing up. Nobody could add anything to card. It was just, it was just a disaster. It was like something... Um, a business does not want to happen yes. with their online store. People so, can't press buy. It's like, yeah, it was like, worst thing I can't that. buy. I'm like, no. Yeah. So it was really, really, and then basically that turned into, um, I, I actually reached out to my husband and he's like, okay, hold your horses. You're good. And then he re and he actually helped rebuild citybox.com from scratch in like 24 and I think it was 48 hours over the weekend he like built it and he's like I'll get yeah. it ready for you don't worry like we'll make this work and so we ended up having to take the subscription box out of city soap and launch it on its own because we couldn't bring it together because we had so many issues on the existing site it was an old theme we had a very difficult time transitioning and bringing it over and so city box was born and um, thankfully that allowed us to kind of push that forward a little bit. And, but we felt what we were doing is we, we totally segmented our customers. We totally segmented the people that were visiting on City's Box for the first time may have not known that we also were part of City Soap. And, and same goes with those purchasing on City Soap that wanted to buy a box. They had to make two separate purchases on our website. So, it wasn't necessarily a very user-friendly experience. We wanted to, we knew that eventually we had to combine those efforts. And that exactly was part of the main um, driver point of this site was how do we take City Box and City Soap, combine them together, and then provide that elevated um, kind of like all thorough experience with this site. Um, so we ended up rebuilding a brand new Shopify store from scratch um, mm -hmm. as though it was the first time 
and just brought all the elements in. Um, and we were so lucky as well to have worked with two different photographers that, um, actually three, I should say three, three different photographers um, uh, that we have tagged in the past, um, one of which is your husband actually in our last trip in, yeah. in Los Angeles, uh, where we haven't had a proper shoot together as, as you know, co-creators, co-founders of City for over three years. And we're like, we're so overdue to having a proper like photo together. So actually our last post is us physically sitting on a table drinking coffee, which was incredible. It was really good coffee. Um, but yeah, I mean, that was, that was, some, that was really exciting. So we really were able to bring all that elements together and be able to launch the site, which you have in front of you. And just to kind of finish off the website talk before we jump into the topic of today's uh, conversation, we are offering 10% um, off the entire site until Sunday. Yes. You're also, for the first 100 purchasers, are also going to be receiving a raw kitchen loofah sponge for the first 100 purchasers. So if you are one of the first 100 people to make a purchase, you will get um, a three-set loofah sponge. These are compostable plant-based sponges to switch off your plastic-based sponges that are destroying our oceans um, so that you can make eco-friendly changes in your home with no sweat. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it. Go check it out and enjoy and give us your feedback. Send us DMs about how much you like or maybe improvements or any comments that you have. We'd love to hear from you. And that's it about my website rent, right? You can. <laughs> I mean, I, yeah, it was, it was a lot of, I think it was one of the, the bigger uh, projects we had this year. And, you know, there was a lot of thought behind it. Um, you know, I think a lot of people don't even realize that we went through a whole like elevated branding in the beginning of the year and that played into it a lot. And it's, yeah, it's, it's growth, it's change and it's, it's really exciting. It's, it's something that I think our whole team should be really proud of because uh, everybody played a role to some degree and it's going to mean an, a better experience, a better storytelling experience too for people who, who come to the site and, and get to know our brand more. So um, please check it out if you haven't. Be one of the first 100 customers or get that 10% off. Uh, so yeah. Um, May, and, and, and maybe this is something I should mention. Um, hi, Dira. They're saying hi. Um, we, I should also mention, we should possibly do a conversation about the whole great like, branding process, because that took months. Yeah. Um, it wasn't something where, you know, designers slapped us with a bunch of colors and a bunch of, you know, and, you know, here you go, like, we went through surveying and, and workshopping and, and all that. And so that was quite the experience and it really helped us better understand ourselves because sometimes, especially as a company that was running for a few years, it's kind of like, do we really understand our target audience? Do we really understand um, our messaging and our storytelling? And we emphasize storytelling so much in everything that we do um, to kind of talk about, you know, tell yeah. the story, but like retelling it and retelling it again and again and again. So um, I definitely think we should have a separate uh, talk about it. If you guys agree, just send some thumbs up and then we'll make sure that we do a topic on that. Um, so today's topic and to go back to today's topic. Wait, 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 oh. wait. We're not doing the today's topic yet. Oh, oh, go. <laughs> we have one more thing. Um, so uh, we have, I mean, on, you, you touched on the fact that the subscription box is now streamlined with our website. Super exciting, very beautiful experience. The second thing is that, um, our second box is coming out very soon. We're yes, yes. This is. I, wasn't, I was like, should we say it now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's coming, and so we we had our first box, as everyone might know, is a women owned and women led brand box. Um, the second box uh, is focused on refugee led and refugee aligned businesses. Um, this is super exciting. I mean, I. I think this is probably going to be a trend where every box 
like I'm like, oh, this box is awesome. And then like I see the next box, I'm like, oh, this box is awesome. Well, well Jackie, listen, wait, I actually want to ask you a question. Um, you just got your box. Yeah. When I, when I came down to California, I handed you the box. Should I? How did you feel opening it? You know, so you know what I do? I, I keep, <laughs> this is for real. I keep the box next to my work desk. So my office is like a tiny little room off of the house. That's, it, it used to be a garage and it has two little tiny windows. There's like no light. I, coming I, I know that place. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All the time in our calls. <laughs> and so I, I have the box at my desk at a shelf and I mean, I feel like a five-year-old saying this, but like I keep the box there and all the things for the most part are still in there. Sometimes like if it's a really hard day, <laughs> I open the box. It's like my own unboxing every day. And I'm like, I like pick through it. It's like a, you know, like a kid's toy chest. And I'm like, oh, this is so cool. This is so cool. <laughs> no, like for real, it's so satisfying to to see all these beautiful brands and gorgeous gorgeous products like honestly i because i hadn't seen the box before other people like i i've seen what was in the box virtually but um nora brought me the box this past week when she was here in california and it was and it really it really does like exceed your expectations and and i'm not saying that from a, a, a subjective standpoint like i was legit like wow this this shit's awesome yeah, I was, like i was actually really telling nice. someone i'm like i don't know if i'm biased but i think our boss box is awesome and they're like no your box is great because they she's like i remember i was talking to someone they're like i've subscribed to so many other boxes and they don't even come close i won't even say the name on this chat but i'm sure you guys know it starts with a c I recently subscribed. Well, I, it's not a C anymore, but yeah. Oh, it's an A now. Sorry, I pulled. Um, <laughs> but I did, I subscribed to it and I was actually quite like, so I had very high expectations getting the box and then maybe it was all part of the marketing. Um, but when I did get it, I was actually a little disappointed. Like it wasn't as big as I thought. It was, um, the items weren't really satisfying for me. It was like maybe one out of all the items. I was like, oh, okay, this I could use. And the rest I was like, maybe I'll re-gift somehow. Um, but yeah, it wasn't. And, and, and so it, it made me feel a little like, oh, wow, our box is quite dope. Like, <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, did you get that? So with, did you... With, I think with that being said, this coming box, not to say the other one wasn't special, is very special. And can you tell us why? Yeah, so this box, aside from the fact that the theme is focused on refugee-led brands, it is also going to be partnered with, we're partnering with UNHCR on this box. Um, UNHCR Canada, uh, we're working with the UN Refugee Agency, uh, which is a global agency, if you're not familiar. They're the UN Global Agency to support refugees uh, around the world. And um, we're going to be contributing $5 uh, from each box sale to UNHCR's efforts in Afghanistan. Um, so just so everybody is reminded of this, um, currently there are about 2.5 million reg registered refugees from Afghanistan, um, and they are considered the largest protracted, meaning like the longest uh, spanning, like kind of long-term, if you will, uh, refugee population in Asia. Um, and they're the second largest in the world. Um, so for us, this is really exciting because we've, we obviously were an organization first and foremost about the self-reliance of the refugee community. Um, but in addition to that, in order for any refugee person to become self-reliant, they need a initial, like they need an organization there to support them to get to that point to reach the point where they are no longer like in an emergent situation. And UNHCR is doing that for our, the Afghans. Um, so we're partnering with them to contribute $5 per box to the UN Refugee Agency to support their work on the ground, providing life-saving care and protection to displaced Afghans, families in need. Um, it's, this is a really big deal because I think it's kind of showing truth to our mission, but also to our model as a social enterprise, which is the fact that 
you know, as a for-profit business, as a for-profit entity, we have the capacity to make these choices to decide based on the information we have out there. Like Nora and I can make a decision with our team and say, this is what we're going to do with this money. This is what we're going to do with these profits. Um, and, and so it's, it's, there's a lot of uh, agency we have within the social enterprise model. Um, but, you know, at the same time, to have a mission that we can rely on to guide us, uh, this, is, this is something we're really excited to do uh, in, you know, in, that, in that way. Um, I think I should also, uh, I, I should also mention um, we also work closely with, you know, team members and people that have uh, direct connections with the Afghan community. Either they are um, from Afghanistan, um, and actually we work with farmers in Herat, Afghanistan, to source our saffron um, um, in partnership with uh, Seen um, and uh to work with Afghan farmers to source saffron that's actually in our saffron olive oil soap. So for those that have purchased it or um, have looked at it, that's actually um, high grade premium saffron that is sourced from Afghanistan and then is sent to Jordan and then, then it's mixed with our premium olive oil to make that premium saffron olive oil soap, which is incredible. I use it every day to wash my face. Um, and I think it's important because we, when you're when you're in direct contact with the community itself, you feel almost paralyzed when you see what's happening on TV and what you're hearing in the news, and you're like, "What is our responsibility? How are we serving that community? How are we able to give back beyond obviously our partnerships and working with people there?" But some we always ask ourselves this question, even though we're a mission-driven company, even though you know we're all about the self-reliance of refugees, we're always asking ourselves. Are we doing enough? What can we do more? And I think as, as consumers, as conscious consumers, we're also asking ourselves that question. Like, you know, are we making the right choices when we're buying what we're buying? Um, and that's kind of really all about it. But to dive into that bo this box, there are so many wonderful, wonderful brands that we have featured, um, some of which are very tasty. And I don't know, the way I would describe this box is, it's more, it's, there's things in there that are like very lifestyle-y, great for your morning routine, potentially, um, and something you could possibly wear. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's basically, there's something for every part of your day in there. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. It's like um, a full, it's a full day's worth of experiences in a box, I think is what you could say. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. I like that. Yeah. But, and every single brand that we picked, um, again, we hand select um, and work with partners that we feel are very aligned to the messaging and the mission that we push forward. This is a refugee led box. So these are brands that either were started by refugees, um, support the refugee community in one way or another, have given back to refugee communities, hire refugees locally, uh, whether it's um, in the United States or in Canada. And, um, you know, support, you know, are, are kind of involved somehow with the refugee community. And so we were able to identify those companies and, and include them as part of the box to really give you that um, ability to be introduced to them, but also enjoy their incredible, incredible products. Right, right. So we can't tell you what's in the box right now, but... <laughs> Not yet, not but, yet. But, I mean, we'll it's show you, really we'll show hard. You some hard spoiler to... alerts really soon. Yeah, yeah, spoilers coming soon. Um, so, uh, we are just about there at the time to bring on our guest. So, I'm so excited. I've actually never met Laura in person. So, I've, like, talked with her over email. I've spoken with her over, um, <laughs> like, we had her actually... Laura was a guest on our blog at one point. Um, we did a whole series on uh, inspiring women within our network who were supporting refugee communities uh, and displaced communities. And she was um, one of them. Her and Pink Jin were, were featured. Um, and uh, since then, she's gone. I mean, she's gone on to do amazing things throughout her entire career. 
Uh, I mean, if you look at her, her just, <laughs> if you look at her CV, it's kind of, uh, it's just, yeah, it's, it's very inspiring. Um, she is going to join us today. So I'm just going to, oh, I think you have to invite her. I'll add her. Um, do you want to just read her little, like, um, it's actually just a very impressive bio, but do you want to read a little bit about her bio while I get her onboarded? Yeah, sorry. I just had another thing pop up on my screen. Sometimes it's hard when these things pop up and then I can't like. Okay, so I just. Okay, so so Laura Cretney, and am I pronouncing that correctly? She'll. I think. Hi, Laura. I'm... She can oh, answer. Here. <laughs> I'm here. Hi. Hi. So, How Laura, are where are you in the world? Uh, right now, I'm in the UK. I am near London, but I've kind okay. of been between here and the Isle of Man, which is where I'm from throughout the pandemic. Um, yeah, so that's where I am now. So you're in the UK, I'm in Canada, and you're in California. We have three time zones, which yeah. is, which is awesome. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> that this is the first time that we're actually sitting down all together and having a conversation. I'm so excited. Do you have your cup of coffee? I don't. I don't. Oh, I can't yes. believe I forgot. I've got my cups behind me that you can probably see them. Oh, okay. You can yeah. <laughs> you want to okay. okay. I'm going to grab a cup and pretend that I'm having coffee. <laughs> and these are made in Palestine by Palestine. Oh, I love artisan. these. These are actually in your in your market. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I can't believe I forgot. Usually, I have one ready every time I go live. <laughs> Those are really beautiful. Um, so Laura, uh, first tell, tell everyone here about yourself, what you do, who you are and, and just kind of, and I mean, we'll talk a little bit more about pink gin in detail, but yeah, we'd love to hear about, about you. Sure. Um, well, first of all, thank you so, so much for having me. It's such an honor to be here. And for that wonderful introduction, that was so sweet. Thank you. I am so grateful to you guys for doing this because I feel like, so, okay, I'm, I'm sort of a semi-entrepreneur, social entrepreneur, neither and both at the same time and a little bit of everything. <laughs> I'm still trying to work out how to introduce myself at parties when people say, what do you do? I'm still not quite sure how to answer yeah. that question. <laughs> so I'm a little bit of everything. Just be like, I'm, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think that works. So um, my background, so I studied Arabic and Middle East politics when I was at university um, and absolutely fell in love with the Arabic language. I went and moved to Oman to study and then later for work and absolutely fell in love with the country um, and the people and the cultures and was just so fascinated by the region. And so I continued to work um, in and on the region in international development. Um, had a bit of a kind of squiggly career, tried a corporate job. It really wasn't for me. So I left um, and set up as a consultant um, uh, with the intention of just figuring out what I was going to do and sorting my life out and getting a real job and then just never went back <laughs> to getting a job. Um, so that's kind of what I've been doing ever since. And so I've been uh, traveling and working in the region quite a lot. And that was when I, well, so that was kind of how Pink Gin came about. It actually started, I'll tell the story in more detail in a minute, but yeah, it, it started as a blog and then sort of became a business. And so I kind of go between um, working on fr like freelance and international development projects um, and running Pink Gin. And now I'm doing my PhD, um, which is supposed to be full time. So I need to <laughs> need to work out the balance there <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> but that's me and that's that's what I do. That's amazing. I'm so jealous because I've always wanted to pursue a PhD and then my path took me a different route. So I, whenever I hear someone doing a PhD, I'm so envy, envious. I'm like, one day, maybe I'll do it on my bucket list. Um, Never too late. Gonna, it's quite a big Never bucket. Seen. It's quite a big bucket. But um, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm so intrigued and so proud of you. And I think that it's just so incredible to like, you know, just reach for it and, and, and put yourself out there because you offer so much insight both from like, an experiential, um, in, like you, you've had your experience with different communities and working with them, but also contributing so much from the academic perspective is so critical. Um, so yeah, thank you. Yeah. I, I mean, that's one of the reasons why I love what you're doing so much because it bridges two very different areas in the kind of social entrepreneurship, humanitarian space and the business space. And I feel like not many people actually bridge that. And I've always felt like kind of, a bit of an, an anomaly or an outlier because I, I kind of 
dip in and out of all of these different spaces and often it, and it doesn't really fit very neatly into people's idea of of a career and so it, it res everything that you do especially with this segment actually with this series the, the kind of the issues that you talk about and the way that you address them resonate so much with me in a way that kind of traditional sort of business and entrepreneurship podcasts and whatever don't necessarily because okay, a lot of those businesses claim to be impact driven, but it's not quite on the same level. And then on the flip side of that, on the kind of humanitarian and development side, there isn't quite the same sort of, it's not quite so inspiring somehow. It doesn't, they don't really push you to kind of think outside the box and just do things in a different way. So I really, really love what you guys are doing with this. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, honestly, it's, 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 I think it's part of our just, the, the way city is started was really about like our responsibility to do something more. Um, and that's kind of how everything kind of, you know, where it is today. And uh, there are some incredible brands doing stuff. And I think it's, it's like you said, it's a very um, weird journey to walk on because a lot of people don't know how to navigate between are we a business or are we, I, you know, a nonprofit? And we get asked this sometimes, you know, we get asked like, are you guys for profit? And um, sometimes people get shocked and we're like, yeah, we run as a company, we run as a corporation, we pay taxes, you know, you have to be able to kind of do your, your due diligence on that part. But um, it's, it's hard for, to be able to commit to a triple bottom line. And then at the same time, you know, run your numbers as a business at the same time. Um, and it's, it's, you're always making very difficult decisions in the process. And uh, we talk about that in, in other, in other episodes, um, as well. Yeah. Mm. Um, but I, so today's topic is what does an inclusive economy, what does an inclusive global economy mean? So what does it mean to you? I guess that's how I'll, I'll start. Just starting with a really nice, simple, and easy question. <laughs> no, <laughs> we like to ease into things. You don't know, dedicate a PhD on at all. No. <laughs> I mean, I guess I can answer this from from my own perspective in terms of my own career, and then I guess also from the sort of development perspective in terms of the work that I've done. Um, I think. This is such a difficult question. I, I really think that what we were just talking about, about crossing, like kind of bridging these different areas is such a huge part of that. And I think that one of the biggest challenges to creating an inclusive global economy is this kind of gulf that exists between business and charity or business and humanitarian work. I think um, that's certainly something that that I've kind of struggled with the same as you guys just defining what what my organization is um and I think that we really if we want to create an inclusive global economy I really think that this is something that we need to kind of reframe the way that the way that we think about it mm -hmm. I mean there's sort of different standards that exist for businesses and for charities rightly so um but they're not necessarily always completely helpful I mean if you think about the way that businesses kind of for-profit capitalist businesses are celebrated when they grow and scale and make more money, um, pay people more, whatever. And yet, if you have the same mindset in a charity in terms of, well, we need to spend money, we need to bring in the right people if we want to scale our impact, people don't like that. I think people quite like the idea that, you know, they, especially when it comes to, to issues like refugees, people quite like the idea that, well, we give our, we give our donation to charity. They want that to be going straight towards funding like blankets or a meal for a refugee. And then they go back to like, you know, shopping on Amazon or whatever. Not that I don't shop on Amazon. I'm definitely just as guilty of that as anybody else. Um, but I think that it's such, a, it's such a mindset thing. Like we celebrate businesses for, for the way that they grow and we don't celebrate charities in the same way. And so I think that social enterprises or for-profit impact-driven businesses, which is what Ping Jin is, um, and what city is? I actually didn't realize that you guys were a for-profit business either. I thought that you were, that you had like a social enterprise registration or, or something similar. I don't know how it works in Canada. Um, but I yeah, think no, that, I mean in, Ca in in Canada only Nova Scotia and maybe recently British Columbia allow you to actually register as a social enterprise. Otherwise, mm -hmm. you're either one or the other. Um, from a from a government perspective, it's really difficult. And we talk about our relationships with nonprofits like CBOs 
Um, and we, we've, we've written about it in the past where we talk about a relationship, for example, with our core partner, Hopes for Women in Education in Jordan and the rehabilitation center that we work with and how we're able to conduct our work um, and navigate between those two very different arenas, right? Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, you were saying pink gin. Yeah, I, I think that organizations like that are really the key to creating a more inclusive economy. Um, I think even I think it's even more important in a way for 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 profit businesses to shift their mindset and become impact driven businesses, like genuinely impact driven businesses. And that's not easy. There's not a lot of, of support for that, I think, especially for smaller businesses in terms of kind of creating a culture where impactful business is not just about kind of donations to charity or the kind of token corporate social responsibility events or gestures or whatever, but about bringing that in at every level. So in terms of our own business practices, in terms of our relationships with our stakeholders and our supply chains. And I think that's a really difficult thing for small businesses that don't have the infrastructure to kind of, you know, they don't have the money to bring in expensive consultants, sustainability consultants. They don't necessarily have the resources to know how to implement sustainability and ethics driven policies. Um, but I think that, that that's really one of the most important things um, that we can do as a kind of business community is, is, is provide that support and build those networks of businesses that are genuinely driven by impact and trying to bring that in at every level of their business to make the global economy more genuinely inclusive. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think that to that point as well, I mean, there is always, you know, you touched on this earlier, there's always so much upset around nonprofits whenever they spend money on something like marketing or, you know, communications. And we'll make mistakes. Right, right. You're not allowed to make a mistake if you're a charity. It's just and, like, so unrealistic. I, yeah, yeah, it is unrealistic. And frankly, I mean, it's to the disadvantage of sometimes the people that they are working with and working for. And, you know, I, 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 I try to, we, we try to steer away from using the words beneficiaries because it, it, it really, it almost in a way puts people in a passive position when it comes to the work that an organization does. But, you know, they do work with communities and those communities are very involved in the day to day of how they operate. But, you know, when, when, a, when a company, going back to this concept of like company versus nonprofit and spending money on, uh, you know, different line items that, <laughs> yeah, you, ha you have this real, uh, ex like unreal expectation. It, it is, it's an unrealistic expectation uh, for a nonprofit to not invest in the longevity of their organization. And that's really what marketing is. It's, yeah. it's storytelling. It's, it's being able to, it's part of the transparency process. It's part of being transparent with, with the people who are your, your donors, your supporters, your clients, your, your employees on the ground, your, you know, your colleagues. Um, and, and so you know, unfortunately, that's still the case. Uh, as a for-profit business, though, we have the the benefit, the advantage to be able to to say, well, we know what this is doing. We know that this money going towards marketing budget is for the purpose of telling the stories of the community we work with on a regular basis. Um, it's it's feeding a larger purpose and. Um, I think that there's there is a real sadness, though, as you mentioned, to the fact that there is still a gulf. There's still this this I don't know gap between those two worlds. There really needs to be more of a, a joining of those worlds. Um, I think there's also like just on that point, Jackie, too, is people also and and this could be a, you know an overgeneralization, but there's also the sense of you know I donated my work here is done. Um, or, you know, and, and I think it's important to realize, like, some of these communities have long protracted conflicts that, you know, the, the one donation, yes, might get them that one blanket potentially <laughs> that they need. But there are other intrinsic issues that are very deep rooted in these communities that don't um, that are that are not resolved overnight. Um, and just to kind of give a small reference, when we first started City, many of the people that were um, hired with us, 
um, you know, started their jobs with Sitsi with a great amount of debt over their heads. And so although we, you know, they were getting um, an income for the most part for a lot of these people, it was just a matter of trying to catch up to this, you know, debt that's kind of overweighing them that's been there and that's that's kind of lingered for for so long and so it's not like you give a job to someone and overnight their situation is kind of back to normal and we can compare them to others i think it's important that um these things take time and that's why when we look at our model of self-reliance is we look at long-term impacts of employment and like what does that do to someone's quality of life how does not just buying that one bar of soap once. I mean, it's great that, you know, someone does, you know, go out and make a conscious effort to buy that one purchase, but how does it, how are we creating a long-term impact? How are we changing communities on a more deep-rooted uh, perspective if we're only thinking of it, oh, okay, I'm done, I did my donation. Um, you know, Afghanistan was all over the news a couple of weeks ago and everybody was rushing to make donations and then there's more hush about it and then suddenly, you know, people forget and, you know, you go back to normal to, you know, your day to day, your Starbucks coffee, whatever it people, is. People, people are already forgetting. I mean, that's, yeah, you know. It, um, so, but, but I think, but part of that, I think part of the conversation of a global inclusive, like inclusive global economy is we're all so interconnected in more ways than we imagine. Um, and I remember from like, this was, I don't know, what, 10 years ago or maybe over, over 10 years ago when I was studying political science in my university and one of the first classes when we were talking about globalization and the change and the, what, is that, what does globalization really mean? And, and I think back to those classes of, you know, never really understanding like the interconnectedness, you know, mm -hmm. my, you know, this fabric that was farmed in, I don't know what country and then, you know, put together and, and the seams and the, I don't know what. And, and then the fact that, you know, I bought it from a particular place and how many touch points did it get to until it got to me? And, and it goes without saying to every single thing that you have. And I, I recall one of my professors and it, and it was like, you know, my, my phrase, which was everything is political. Everything in whatever, this pencil is political. And, and even in like the littlest ways of thinking about it. Um, and so when we think of things from that perspective and not, I'm not trying to politicize this conversation but when we think of it from that conversation we realize that like everything has deep rooted connectivity um, connectedness that we're attached to unconsciously or consciously um, and it, it's up to us to kind of make that effort to see how we're positively contributing to it or or we're being um complacent to them. Uh, and so I'm curious, actually, so Laura, with, with Pink Gin, you know, how has, um, how has Pink Gin been this kind of conduit for, you know, cross-cultural conversations for, you know, I'm curious where, can you tell us a little bit more about that origin story? And then, you know, how, how, how does Pink Gin really, because I, I think it's really a, a it epitomizes this concept of an inclusive global economy to a certain extent. So talk a little bit about that. Um, so Pink Gen kind of started by accident, really. Um, it was never supposed to be a business. I started it actually um, as a blog about five or six years ago now when I just moved back from Oman. And I was getting so many questions from people back home saying, oh, do you, did you feel safe out there? You know, what's it like for a woman out there? Um, and at the time, there wasn't really a huge amount online there's so much more now but back then there wasn't really a huge amount of information online about the region unless you really looked for it that wasn't either very political kind of very like coming through the media which was obviously overwhelmingly negative and and kind of plagued with these stereotypes of the region um or kind of lifestyle fashion quite superficial and so i wanted to kind of bring that together a bit more and kind of look at culture and politics in a more holistic way. Um, so that was how it started. And then I kind of kept writing the blog while I was while I was working out in the region. Um, and I found I would always come home with a suitcase full of stuff that I bought out there. And I was like, wouldn't it be amazing if I could sell this stuff back home? Because I think that so it's all kind of like cultural, culturally inspired and like craft products that are such a big part of telling the story of a different place. And it's funny you say about it in a way it is, it does kind of epitomize um, 
this kind of um, global connectedness. But at the same time, I think actually some of the biggest impact that it has is very, very local. Um, and I wonder if that's maybe something that we need to flip on its head in that, yes, the, the kind of challenges that, that we face today as a civilization are all global. They're not national. We need to collaborate. We need to work together. But in order for people to get past that place of overwhelm and just kind of switch off and check out, I think, I think where we can make the most impact and where we can change the most minds in a way is in our local community, the people who, um, for example, for me, the people who I can talk to face to face, the people who I meet at markets where I'm selling my stuff and I get to tell them the story. I get to tell them about the communities that made the coffee cups and the earrings and whatever, and mm-hmm. where the frankincense fits into the local culture in Oman. And it seems it, it brings something that seemed very far away and was very easy to disconnect yourself from and brings it, makes it very um, kind of personal. And I think that this is something that you guys do so beautifully is the storytelling is telling the story of the products, where they fit into the local culture, what they mean to the people who made them and what their story is. Um, and I think that we need to, I think, I think that that's probably one of the most important things that we can do is just focus on telling those stories and not discount the impact that we can have. But even if we do have a, a global company that's, that's, you know, connected to communities all over the world. I, I mean, Pink Gin, our kind of business model is our community. We don't have a, any one product or service. I've kind of built this mm-hmm. community of people with a shared worldview and shared values. And, it, and those people and, and that worldview are having a bigger impact than I ever anticipated on my kind of local community on the Isle mm-hmm. of Man, which is like a tiny, tiny island, much more culturally diverse today, but it never was when I was growing up. You know, I'd never met anyone from the Middle East when I was at school. Um, and being able to, some of the conversations that I've had with, with local people actually over the last couple of years since I've, I've started the souk and I've been do, going to markets and stuff have ju- has just been so kind of enlightening in the way that it's made me think about where I can have the most impact like I always Mm -hmm. thought that I need to get off the island I need to get away and you know be elsewhere in the world and do more on a kind of bigger stage if I can um but actually I think it can be just as powerful to sort of bring those Mm -hmm. stories home that that's so I mean it's so true and I know like Nora can certainly speak to this as doing so many of the markets in in Canada and uh doing that for City and then um you know, I likewise, I mean, I've done, a, you know, fraction of the markets that Nora's done, but I will say that the ones that I've done here in the States, uh, when I was living in Baltimore, and hopefully very soon here in California, but, you know, people are, it, it starts with intrigue, right? It starts with this intrigue of something that's different and something that frankly is foreign to a lot of people. And, and then very quickly, it turns into this curiosity, which turns into this love and feeling of connectedness. And I think that there's, there's a common, I, I think it's important, you know, we always try to make sure that our storytellers are, our storytelling is inclusive of the actual community we work with, right? Because we obviously cannot tell their stories in in a just way without their voices. Um, But we also have to be honest about the fact that, as you said, we are in these places where there is a thriving economy and, you know, comparatively speaking, and we are in a place where capital is king. We are in this, you know, European Western society where we know there is a lot to be shared and a lot to be, um, contributed. So for us to be able to be that conduit and to, to, to be that, um, that kind of bearer of these people's story and, and of their products and stories through those products, I think is, it's, it's such a, it's, it's a real power actually. And so I think it also comes with a real, a real need requirement for respect for those communities and respect for that culture. Um, because it, it also, it is, I mean, it happens where those things are misused, right? And, and so there's also the question of, you know, we, we talked about this a little bit in the summary of the episode, but like, how do we ensure that those local communities are also receiving a return on the investment of their time and their, their talents 
when it comes to those products. And so I'm curious for, for Pink Gin, and we can talk about this more for City as well, but like, how do you ensure that those communities are receiving that return on investment? I mean, I guess for Pink Gin, it's slightly different in that um, we're not producing the products ourselves. We're sourcing from businesses, social enterprises, artisans. And I think the supply chain aspect of that is is hugely important. And it's also something that I'm kind of learning a lot as I go along. Um, I mean, so for me, my kind of process is when I find a supplier that I want to work with or um, a product that I love, I want that supplier to be very much a stakeholder in my business and that I want to build a relationship with that supplier that lasts over time. Um, you know, I don't want to just be buying from random people every now and again and not knowing who it, who I'm buying from. Um, and then I try and use the website, the blog, our social media channels to tell the story behind that product and tell the story behind that community. Um, so where does it come from? What is its place in the culture? Um, ultimately, I think the biggest area where that I have, you know, to learn um, is within that building sustainable supply chains. Um, and I think that's why it's so powerful that you guys are having these kinds of conversations because it's sharing your journey. And I think that that's, that's something that a lot of people, um, you know, small businesses, individuals, women, when they start a business, they want it to be impactful. Um, they want to source responsibly, but they don't know how. And I guess I'm quite lucky in a way in that I at least have a network in the Middle East. You know, I can speak the language. I can kind of take that due diligence a step further than a lot of people might be able to. Um, but still, you know, it's a learning curve. And I, I set up my my shop two months before the pandemic. Mm. So I haven't been able to travel out to the region to go and visit my suppliers, go and, you know, look at where the products are made and make sure that, you know, everything is being done the way that the way that they're telling me that it is and that I am kind of that the, it is the most impactful um, way of working. Mm. Um, and so that's something I'm always I'm always kind of learning about. And actually, I think I probably should talk more about this and use my platform more to talk about this. I guess it's just one more one more thing then that I have to kind of think about uh, sort of creating content around. But I mean, conversations like this, where they're just so authentic, you're sharing your journey, I'm sharing mine, I think is so, so, um, so impactful in terms of just showing people that um, there's a way around it, you know, pe people, businesses, they're not perfect, everybody's kind of learning as mm. they go. Um, and that's very much where I'm at. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, I, and I think you touched on a really good point, which is, you may not be manufacturing the stuff yourself, but you're a very key component to this artisan that relies on this global economy where he has someone that he can supply his um his products you know at a fair price that is purchased that kind of can value and can retell his story in another way because on his own he can't do it or she can't do it and it's important that that's where we come in as social enterprises, as resellers, as, you know, markets that, um, you know, as, as social entrepreneurs, um, that's where we come in to, to work with these like-minded communities that we want to tell their story and use our platform in a way to do so. Because I think what often happens is, um, and, and we've seen this, and, and this is kind of part of our, like, birth story with City, which was, you know, international organizations that will teach communities skills and then assume, okay, if we teach them a skill and they know how to make this like X, Y, Z product, that's it. They're good for life. You know, it's kind of this, this model of um, teach a man to fish, uh, uh, give a man fish every day to eat or teach him to fish and then he'll eat for life. Um, but we're not just giving them food. We're giving them a way to sustain self-reliance to help feed their entire families um, and so it's not enough to be like, here's a skill. You now know how to make soap or you now may know how to make, you know, whatever it is, you know, go out into the real world. And what we, we don't realize is a lot of these communities are cut off from major competitive global, um, like there are, there are literal structure bar barriers 
um, they'll allow them to function like a normal business. You know, they, they wouldn't be able to market like they wanted. They probably would need a lot of capital to push things in a certain way. And that's, again, that's our role. I think it, it almost adds that sense of responsibility when we do engage with these types of artisans and these communities. It's our responsibility, not if, I think not enough to just source the product, but source the product and ensure that we give the artist's dignity and that space. Like you said, bring them in. As and, a and, and the living wage and, and all these things that require self-reliance. I mean, it, it goes beyond also the storytelling. And I think that's, that's the biggest challenge in some ways for a lot of companies, social enterprises is, um, is, is being accountable to, to those really like critical ways of, of living and, and for these communities to, to be able to, to be self-reliant, to, to not rely on, on just charitable work. Um, Nora, I'm just looking at the time and I don't know. We like, I think, I mean, I'm just, I think we have a few, a couple of minutes left. Um, Um, and so we will jump through the list of questions we still had for you. I swear, I think we need a part two series. So please we say should, yes I to think, another. I think we please should say do yes part to two. another this is, invite. Yeah, I would love to. I think we've got so much more to cover on this. This is such a huge topic. I think it was ambitious to think that we were ever going to cover this in one session. <laughs> we need more than an hour. Um, but really, really quickly, I'll leave it with like one last question to you. What is one of the biggest or most difficult lessons you've learned while working to raise more awareness and cultural understanding about the region? If you can answer that, you know, in, in 30 seconds or less. No. Okay. I think, um, I think the hardest thing that I've had to learn is not everybody's going to care. And that's a really, really hard thing to learn, especially when you're in this, when you've created this project or this organization, you've put so much of yourself into it. Um, And also I think people kind of, people feel things and understand things in different ways. Like for me, I kind of, I I really feel things that that I see, like I take on other people's stories. And I kind of have this weird like roller coaster where I get like really, really down about the world sometimes. But then I kind of I'm trying to reframe it as like my superpower because then I come out the other side and I'm like, okay, let's do something about it. Whereas I think a lot of people have like a a much more functional, just kind of steady level. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really hard sometimes when to to kind of accept that not everybody is going to care about a particular issue in the same way that you do. And that doesn't mean that they're not good people or that they don't have empathy. It's just that people experience that in different ways. And I think that's definitely been one of one of the hardest things that I've had to learn. And it, certainly with working on issues such as um, refugees and migration, you get a lot of pushback on that and some really kind of nasty negative narratives. And that's been a really hard thing to kind of stay positive in the face of. Um, but I think in itself, when, when you kind of, when you deal with an issue like that, if you're advocating for refugees or you're advocating for vulnerable people, I think there's sort of an ego thing in there as well in that you think, well, I must be an empathetic person because look at me advocating for these people. But actually I think it takes more empathy sometimes to be able to put yourself into the shoes of the people who disagree with you or who are pushing back on this mm-hmm. um, and to try and understand where that narrative has come from. Um, so I think that, that that's definitely been a big, a big lesson for me and a lesson in empathy um, and it's kind of incre- yeah, it's, in- it's increased my capability for empathy, I think, and helped me to learn to relate to people better, which has is- been incredibly helpful for me, both personally and professionally. Yeah, and you know what? That's, I'll, I'll, that's great. For, from an from an economic perspective, um, I'll I'll just kind of share something. I think the same goes with making a purchase. Not when I when I think of it, and and I recall, and I tell the story a lot is you know when we first started, I remember my dad was saying. Um, you know, no one's going to buy your $10 bar of soap. And I was like, well, that's okay, dad. You're not my target audience. Like you're not, you're not who I'm trying to sell to. Um, and that's, and, and not everyone can be at a level with it where they want to, or they, or they really care about, you know, all the ingredients that are in there and, and, and what is being sourced in the community that we're serving. And that's okay. And I think um, you touch on such a good point that you're not going to satisfy everyone. You're not going to serve everyone, but you need to understand who, is the audience that you want to speak to. And that's the thing also part of City is really understanding like 
who are we speaking to? Who are the consumers or, or, or the day-to-day -day people that care about these issues that want to know more, that want to find an opportunity to contribute? And that's who we satisfy. And it's not that there are people that care about it. They just can't participate in the economy of it because, you know, let's be honest, they just can't afford to pay you know, certain dollar types, um, you know, for fair trade, because, they're, you know, for fair traded, ethically sourced, you know, certain ingredients that are very premium, they just can't afford it. And that's something that we have to, that we have well, to. Well, and that's, that's, that's a large. That's why there's alternatives, right? There's the massive. But there's, it, there's a larger global, I think, go, going into part two of this conversation, we, we definitely should talk about what are the larger systems in place that prevent people from being able to participate in a fair trade economy as purchasers, as consumers, yes. because that in and of itself is, is in a, you know, it, it stands in the way of inclusivity. Um, yeah. So, I think so often, so often that is such a kind of psychological thing as well, or a lack of awareness or education about what people actually can do to make a huge mm -hmm. impact without having to spend $10 yes. on a bar of soap right. if they don't have that $10. And I think that's a huge kind of education piece as well, which all, which we as organizations can be doing as well to show that look, we're not just we're not just trying to sell this product. It's like this is a philosophy and we want people to to just be more conscious of how the little decisions that they make in their everyday lives can have a huge yeah. impact. Exactly. Yeah. I don't want to close this chat. I think I, so I can great. keep going. <laughs> But I know, I, I know that eventually Instagram will cut us off and we're at our one hour point. Um, I'll leave it with everyone to leave maybe a final couple of points. And then I hope we could do a part two next month. If you're, if you're willing, Laura, cause this is just the, this is literally just the beginning of like scratching the surface. And, and I'd love to, you know, engage more about, you know, your journey and even to discover a little more about like the artisans they featured, the regions and the areas, um, within the Middle East that you touch on, not just Jordan, but I know you've gone to other parts um, in the Middle East that, you know, are all over kind of um, your shop. And please, if you guys don't, if you have just joined us, yes, check out Pink Jing's um, store. Mm -hmm. um, she is offering incredible stories and her blogs are just so wonderful to read. It's a whole <laughs> resource. It's actually like a whole hub yes. because I'm also, I mean, I want to talk about this, like the fact that you are completely fluent in Arabic and have lesson plans and I mean, all these resources, it's, it blows my mind. I, I don't know how you do it, but um, yeah, we will have a link to Pink Gin in the show notes as well as on Instagram on the IGTV episode. So we'll make sure to link to you there to, to Pink Gin there. Um, thank you so much, Laura. This was such a treat. It was like, Yeah. It was amazing. Thank you so much for having me. I've absolutely loved talking to both of you. And I love what you've created here. Like you've, you're have creating such a powerful network of people doing such amazing things. And I think going back to what I was saying before about how do we build a, a, an inclusive global economy? It's building those networks of people who are just doing things differently and sharing their journeys as they go. So I'm mm. so, this is a resource I'm so grateful for. So thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much, Laura. Me. And I, I do, I do want to leave it up with the final point of we're all just like, for those that are watching, even like Siti, like me, Nora, Jackie, Laura, like we're all learning in this process. This is part of a journey that we're constantly learning, constantly growing and developing on, um, you know, our, our, the, you know, the structural, um, the, the structures that we're trying to build to help create a more global inclusive economy. And, and there isn't a right and wrong answer necessarily. And we may have gone through wrong paths or we may have not necessarily done everything right. But I think working on it, it's kind of like a work in progress type of thing. And, and it's not like you're handed a manual to be like, this is how to conduct business in the, you know? Um, and I think it's, it, I just wanted to kind of throw that out there because um, it, it's great to kind of be seen as, um, setting the pathway for other social enterprises, but we're also learning in the process, yes. right? It's always, yes. it's always something where we question ourselves. We kind of review like, wait, like, did we do it right? Like, how can we improve? Um, Especially even as women. We launched, even yes. as we launched our- And that's a whole impact, other conversation. <laughs> yeah, like even as we launched our, our impact report after we were done, we're like, okay, how can we improve this? How can we look at, you know, looking at what we've produced and then kind of, improving how we work on the ground and allowing us to look within so that we can continue to be a better form to serve not just the community, but the people that continue to support us on a day-to-day -day basis. So thank you guys so much. Um, 
go visit ccsoap.com. Go visit Pink Gin. Thank you for joining us um, for episode seven of, of Sips with Sipsy. We'll see you next month. Yes, I can't wait for part two of this conversation. Neither can we. <laughs> Me too. I can't wait for it too. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. God bless. Bye. 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 Ma'asalama. Ma'asalama. Bye. Ma'asalama. <laughs>